So we're kind of starting a new ser uh, series today. We kind of started it a month ago. Uh, if you remember a month ago, we looked at that vision of the Lord in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, and it, it really is an important prelude to these seven letters. Um, and you'll see that part of what happens in these seven letters is that vision is reflected in the letters that are written to the churches. So that's important just to hang on to. These are, the, in the red dots there, these are the seven churches that the letters are written to. And it follows, if you, if you follow the biblical um, series, it follows a, a path from Ephesus north, Smyrna, Pergamos, and then southeast all the way to Laodicea being the last one. So it's a, a loop it follows as, the, as we read these, um, these letters by John. Now John, it is said, is on the Isle of Patmos, which is actually not shown here, but it's between Kos, if you, could, if you see below Ephesus, there's Kos, and then there's Salmos, which is almost near Ephesus. It's between those two, and it's a really tiny little island. It's not actually shown there at all. Um, but that's where John is when he's writing the letters to, to these churches. And you can see it's in modern day Turkey. Okay, so on the, on the um, not the Caribbean, the Mediterranean. Now each of the letters has common features to it. So the first thing I've already mentioned is that it begins with part of the description of the Lord from <coughs> chapter 1. And it follows on, each letter then says, I know your works. And there's some kind of a commendation of the church there. Okay, something that each church is doing right. And then it says, nevertheless, I have this against you. And there's some form of criticism of what they're doing. There's often something wrong that's happening. Then each of the churches has this sentence in it, each of the letters. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And, and then to him who overcomes, there's a promise that is held out to each of the churches. Now, there's been various attempts to unwrap what these letters each mean. And if you go and do a Google search, for example, you'll come up with lots of charts about the seven churches and do they represent eras of history? Do they represent a series of development? Um, those sorts of ideas. So we're going to explore some of this, but there's very clearly some meaning to these letters. You know, they're written to particular communities within that area of Asia Minor, but there's very definitely a sense that you know, there's, there's, a, there's a meaning for each of us in all of these letters and that's what we're going to explore. So we're going to begin, as John does, with Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is one of the few places I've been to. And I don't know whether you recognise this chap here, but this is me 29 years ago when Pam and I took a, a trip we spent um, two weeks sailing around the Gulf of Galuk, which is just, you can see there on the map actually, just north of Koz is the Gulf of Galuk. And we took a day trip to Ephesus on the bus. Ephesus was once a port city. It was an important place of trade. But now, because the river that it was on has silted up, it's actually a couple of kilometres from the coast. Bottom left here, you can see the... Um, facade of the old Ephesus Library. Uh, the city also hosted uh, a temple to Artemis or Diana, the Greek goddess. And there's an account in the Book of Acts of a riot that is stimulated by this, um, uh, by this early church community um, because it's disrupting the trade in uh, trinkets and things that were sold in praise of Diana. And then also, top right, there's this rather grand amphitheatre, uh, which is obviously in ruins, but it's still used today. You can still see some very famous um, 
performers perform at the Ephesus Amphitheatre. It holds something like 40,000 people. In all that I'm dealing with today, I'm not trying to be exhaustive. That's one thing I want to say about this journey. It's very much my own personal reflections on the text. So, for example, there was reference to a group called the Nicolaitans, which I'm going to set aside today because they'll come up again and we'll deal with them another time. So it's very much my own reflections on, on the text. So as I said, we begin with this description of the Lord. And uh, here is uh, Roland Smith's drawing of that vision of the Lord in chapter one. And just mentioning the, the couple of um, elements from that vision that are mentioned here in this letter. So the idea that the Lord holds the seven stars in his right hand and he walks in the midst of the lampstands. And what I note about that is it's all to do with light. And the Lord, who is the light of the world, is said to hold the light and to walk amongst the light. That's one of the key things really about this, um, this letter and this, this, the way that it relates to that vision. So that's what we have to hold on to, the light of the Lord. So let's go on to the commendation that is mentioned about Ephesus. It says, And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Do you see, if we're to test anything rightly, we need a source of truth to test it against. And that source of truth has to be the Lord. It can't be our own. It's not our own perspective that's, that we test anything against. That's not going to be a true test. It has to be the Lord. So that's the first thing we need to know. But the second thing is, when you test something, you test an attitude or an opinion, you actually need to listen to that attitude or opinion. You need to hear what someone says, you need to understand it and grasp it fully before you have any chance of then saying, well, it's right or wrong. So you need to be able to hold the light, which is not of your own making, hear what is being said and compare the two. That is what is required. And in actual fact, what we have to understand with this process of testing is we ourselves are tested in the process. So the veracity or of, of what I believe is tested in this process of testing the attitudes and opinions of others. And that's something we don't always appreciate. We like to think that our own attitudes and beliefs are correct, but they're not always. So we have to understand that we ourselves are tested in this process. So, so often when we hear someone speak, we react. We react on the basis of the language they've used or our particular understanding of one word. And, and we judge it on that basis. Sometimes we react on the basis of our perception of the person. You know, do I like them? Don't I like them? Therefore, I accept what they say or I don't accept what they say on that basis. We test it on what we believe is good and right and acceptable and sometimes that is based on cultural norms. Sometimes we test what we hear based on whether we got up out of the right side of bed in the morning or not. You see, there's all of these ways that we test things that are not real, actually. The only thing we can test anything in is the light of the Lord. A great many people think they are thinking when they are merely rearranging their prejudices. Interesting thought, isn't it? So to truly test something takes time and effort and patience and humility, all of those things. And then we move on. We have the, um, the criticism of the church at Ephesus. And it says that you have left your first love. 
Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. So here's something we don't often understand. The ability to test the truth, the veracity of something, is not in itself sufficient to claim spiritual life. The truth that we have must be applied to our own lives. It really is, is as simple as that. The truth that we have must be practised. Now, when we look at what Swedenborg writes about the church at Ephesus, it's very easy to get very critical about them. He says so very much about the idea of faith alone and he's so often critical of this idea of faith alone. But I just want to share that I think it's actually a stage in the process and it's a necessary stage. This is what Swedenborg writes. All those in the church are meant who are in the knowledges of truth and good. Thus in the knowledges of such things as are of heaven and of the church and who still are not or not yet in a life according to them. And I hang on to that or not yet. And I get a sense of a, a potential here. You see, this is very definitely the first stage of a process. You know, if you think about the process of creation, what was the first thing created? Light. Light. The beginning of the process of spiritual growth is the creation of light. It is the coming to see, you see. So it's a very necessary first step in the process. It's just that we can't get stuck there. We have to then move on beyond it, beyond the ability to see. And then there's the threat. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So there's that urging to move on. Okay, so accept the light but then begin to practice it. Because if you don't begin to practice it, what happens? Well, you lose the light. You lose your ability to see. And then finally, I'm going to move on to this one, to him who overcomes the promise. I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, the tree of life gets mentioned elsewhere in the book of Revelation. Does anybody know where? Oh, I'm in Genesis, yes, but I'm thinking in Revelation, the tree of life. Right at the end. Yes, yes, it's right at the end. There it is found in the holy city, the New Jerusalem. And it's just interesting if you regard the seven churches as a, a series, a progression, and Ephesus is the first stage along with the creation of light, it's just interesting, there's this vision of the end in there as well. And why is that? Well, I think it's this. When we begin any journey, we begin with a view of the end. We begin with our goal, where we want to go. So, for example, if you climb a mountain, you can start with a vision of the top. And you might even imagine yourself being at the top. As you progress through the journey, if you've ever climbed a mountain, it's interesting, isn't it? You often lose sight of that goal, that you can't see necessarily the top of the mountain when you're in the midst of the process. But to begin, you can see the top. If you begin learning an instrument, or if you begin learning to code or learning to draw or paint or developing any skill, we often begin with a sense of where we will be when we finished. And often, as we're going through the process of learning that particular skill, we lose sight of that. Why? Because it's difficult, it's struggle. We find, you know, we, we can often become despondent. Oh, I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to learn this thing. I'm never going to be any good but we begin with a vision of the goal at the end. And the third one is marriage. 
When we're first married, those first few months and years are often idyllic. They're often a beautiful, wonderful, easy time. We have a sense of what marriage is, but then as we progress, as we have children and they grow up and there's struggles with money and all this sort of stuff that goes on, we can lose sight of the end goal. But the vision, if we can hold it, can sustain us through all of that strife and struggle and get us through to the end. And I just think it's just one of those wonderful things, this idea that at the beginning of the process we have a vision of the end which if we can hold on to it can sustain us through whatever it is that we face that will take us there. I think the same is true of the spiritual journey. So many people um, I read, you know, when they, uh, especially you know, evangelical Christians, when they get baptised, they, they make their commitment to the Lord and begin what they believe is a Christian life. They, they do so with such wonder and uh, enthusiasm and they kind of feel that, well, I've made it. You know, I am a Christian. But that's to forget the struggle that's to come. That initial enthusiasm is just a vision of the goal. But what we know is going to happen is the process that we must then go through which will carry us to the end. And we need to know that the Lord is with us in that struggle. And that vision we hang on to because that will help sustain us as we travel. So we begin with this sense of promise, but we must also then have the inner conviction to begin the actual journey. And that's what the Lord is asking of those people in the church of Ephesus and what he's asking of us.